Welcome to RWM Blue Water Ministry. I'm your host, Bob Minot, and we're continuing in the Holy Spirit series. Uh, in the past, um, we started off with part one, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Then we did part two, the deposit of the Holy Spirit. And last time, we did part three, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Today, we're doing part four, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've tried very hard not to inject much of my own opinion in this, but simply point out what the Bible says about the subject. I want the Bible to speak for itself. I will only highlight what the Bible said. So, hear the Word of God. Acts 8, 14 to 17. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. So when it says that they uh, had only received the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus, I mean, that's talking about the baptism in water. And so I want to make a distinction, because uh, last time we, there was there were some disciples that said they had only been baptized in the name of John. And that had to do with uh, repentance. And, and people who were baptized, basically you're saying, uh, in whoever's name you were baptized in, that's who you're following. And they said they were baptized in the name of John, which was a baptism of repentance. But once Jesus came, I mean, John said, there's one coming after me who I can't, I'm not even worthy to, to touch his sandals. And he's going to baptize you uh, with the Holy Spirit and fire. So when people had uh, received Jesus as Lord and Savior, then at that point they're to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Um, some scriptures say uh, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But certainly baptized in the name of Jesus, that means what you're declaring is you've received salvation. Uh, Jesus is your Lord and Savior and you're baptized in the name of Jesus. So that's the baptism in water. But, then it says, verse 17, But then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, who already were baptized in the name of Jesus, and they received the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit. Now, we established last time that when you get saved, then there's a deposit of the Holy Spirit put in you. And in that deposit of the Holy Spirit, there is the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and uh, we read that in, in Galatians 5, 22, 23 talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. So all that stuff is in you and it needs to be stirred up and come out of you. But that's you've got that. When you got salvation, you got the deposit of the Holy Spirit, you got the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But now they're saying, okay, so when, when, when the Apostle Paul came across these believers, they already have that. They have salvation. They have the deposit of the Holy Spirit. They have fruit of the Holy Spirit. But uh, Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers and they received the Holy Spirit. And so we're, 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 when we read other scriptures here, you're going to see it's, they were receiving, at first they got the deposit, now they're receiving the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, the next scripture we're going to read is the record of the gospel coming to the Gentiles, which in itself is the fulfillment of prophecy. Now this is going to be a, a lengthy portion of scripture. I'll try to read it slowly so you can, so you can stick with me here. Uh, so at this point, the, the message of salvation through Jesus had only been accepted by the Jews and the Samaritans who were part Jewish. So we're looking at Acts 10, verses 1 to 48. So like I said, it's a lengthy portion. Uh, so we'll, we'll go slow. I want you to understand and capture everything that's being said here. So uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 1. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius. So right off the bat, he's Roman. He's not Jewish. This is not a Jewish person, but he's a person who feared God. So it says, a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God 
coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. You might want to just a little underline that. When you give gifts to the poor and, uh, and prayers, it goes up to God as an offering. Anyway, verse 5. Now send some man to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon a tanner who lives near the seashore. Verse 7. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. So verse 9. <coughs> the next day, Cornelius' uh, messengers were nearing the town. Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon. And he was hungry, but while a meal was while while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open up, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, "Get up, Peter, kill and eat them." Verse fourteen. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? Just then, the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get, get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you are looking for. Why have you come? So they said, We were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he could hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. They arrived in Caesarea the following day. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together all his relatives and close friends. So imagine, Cornelius knows they're coming. He's got a house full to hear. According to the angel, send for Simon Peter. Let's hear his message. As Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. Peter pulled him up and said, Stand up. I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together. And then went inside, where many others were assembled. So Peter told them, You know, it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this, or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for now tell me why you sent for me. Cornelius replied, Four days ago I was praying in my house about this same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. He told me, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying in the home of Simon a tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once. And it was good of you to come. Now we are all here, waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel. 
that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Verse 44. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, Can anyone object to their being baptized now, now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So you see, these were already believers, um, but as as he as he pray as, as Peter was telling them about Jesus, um, the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on them, and and so suddenly, which is a fulfillment of prophecy that um, a light has shone, and it has come to the Gentiles, and. Uh, for they heard them speaking in other tongues. So, you know, I just got to point out again, people who say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, miracles, all that stuff died with the disciples. And generally, I, I believe they're saying, they're talking about the 12, but maybe they're talking about their disciples. But, I mean, here we are, now it's gone to the Gentiles. It's not just for the Jews. And that, you know, when Jesus said, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit and you'll receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Well, it's not just for the Jews because they were only there in, in, in that area. That, you know, the ends of the earth means the Gentiles. And he said, take the message out there. Well, then um, Peter still didn't understand that until he saw that vision. Don't call unclean what I've made clean. And now he's gone to Cornelius. Uh, and so he's preached the message and the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they're speaking in tongues. So if it hit the Gentiles, it's going to hit to the outer ends of the earth, which means to you, the promise is for you, your children, and all those who are far off. And, and, and that includes us 2,000 years later. We are still able to receive the promise. Acts 19, verse 1 to 7. Again, this, you know, we, we covered this last time, uh, Paul's third missionary journey. 19, uh, verse 1. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? And here's where... They, they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, which means they were baptized in water. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So, God made a promise, and he's not holding back. People were getting this gift. So, Romans 
8.26. And the Holy Spirit, I, I better start here. This is the, uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome. So he's writing to the Romans. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. You know, and I, and I think many of us have had the experience where a loved one or, or somebody, uh, a neighbor or somebody close to us has, has, has had a, a, a major health problem. And, and you know, whether, whether it be a, a heart attack or a stroke of some kind, and they may be aged, and you're sitting there and you're thinking, uh, I'm not sure how to pray. I mean, do I, do I pray for healing? Uh, do I pray that, Lord, take him home? <laughs> you know, uh, like, we're, we're, you're just not sure what God's will is. I mean, you all pray according to God's will, uh, and you want to pray what's right, and uh, you're not too sure what to pray. What this is saying, in Romans 8, 26, it's saying the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Now, this says groanings, and but I'm, I'm going to suggest to you, and I think we'll see it afterwards, that praying in tongues, uh, praying in a, in a prayer language, is another way. It's, we're not praying with our understanding. We don't know what to pray for. But when we pray in tongues, it's our spirit praying according to the will of God. And, uh, and so I believe this verse kind of falls in that range. But like I told you, I'm not going to throw out my opinions in here. I, I believe the, the scriptures will back that up. And so we'll keep on going. 1 Corinthians 14. And again, this is a letter now that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. So this is the Corinthians. Uh, it's entitled Tongues and Prophecy. So chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1 to 21. Verse 1, <clears throat> let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives. So in other words, it's talking about the abilities that the Holy Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. All right, so I'll just highlight this is a letter that Paul's writing. Now, Paul, you know, back in Acts, um, there was a point in time when Paul was, was he, he was one of the Pharisees. He was arresting Christians. He was throwing the Christians in jail. He was persecuting them. And on the way to Damascus, he saw a vision of Christ and got blinded. He got led to Damascus. And, uh, and then uh, the Spirit led somebody, and, and I asked to come and pray for him so that the scales would fall off his eyes so he could see. Paul became, a, uh, he, was, he was called Saul then, and he became a believer. And uh, anyway, so then he, he, he took on the name of Paul now, and he's in, on missionary journeys, preaching Jesus. The one he persecuted, he is now preaching. And, um, and so, you know, well, I'm making this point because he wasn't one of the original disciples. He came afterwards, he got saved, and now here he is out there, and he's preaching the message, you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. So prophesying was, he's already preaching this, that's way beyond the original disciples. It's, it's, been, it's been moving out, the promise being fulfilled. Verse 2, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. Listen carefully as I read on here, because I want you to understand. He's saying, if you speak in tongues, you'll be talking to God. So, if you speak uh, in, your, in your understandable language, people around you will understand what you're saying. If you speak in tongues, they won't know what you're saying. Uh, comes back to that last verse we read, uh, through groanings. Um, the Spirit will know what you're saying. Okay, When we don't know what to pray, we can pray in, in, in groanings and, and in tongues. The Spirit of God will know what you're saying. So you may not know how to pray, but the Spirit knows. Okay. Um, you, uh, 
If you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit. So understand that. that that's, that's a positive thing. If you're praying in tongues, you'll be speaking by the power of the Spirit. That's a good thing, but it will all be mysterious. The one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, comforts them. Verse 4, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but the one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Get that. When you pray in tongues, you are strengthened personally. That's not a bad thing. To get spiritual strength from praying in tongues, that's a good thing. But he's saying, if you're in church, the one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. That's a good thing. So verse 5, I wish, I wish all could speak in tongues. But even more, I wish you could all prophesy. So the implication there is he says, I wish you could all speak in tongues, kind of implies that, well, okay, not everybody could speak in tongues. Um, so the word says it, it's, it, it's a promise for all, um, but some people have difficulty receiving it, and it, even as it is today, some people have trouble receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So, <clears throat> some, uh, some people have difficulty with it, other people just get it like that. I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. Uh, so if he's wishing you could all prophesy, that again suggests that not everybody is prophesying. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues. So there, there, there's no debate about that. He's, 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 Paul is making it very clear. Prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues. Unless someone interprets. Okay. Unless someone interprets. So... Uh, when we start talking, in the next part, uh, part five, when we talk about uh, the, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we'll talk about what, what are the attributes that the Holy Spirit actually brings. <clears throat> and it talks about prophecy, it talks about tongues and interpretation. Tongues and interpretation is just another way of prophesying. Uh, at tongues, and then you know somebody will speak in tongues and somebody else will interpret. It says here... <coughs> Prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church is strengthened. So if somebody interprets, then it's the same as prophecy. So if you have tongues and prophecy, if you have tongues and interpretation, it is like prophecy. Verse 6. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, if I would come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? I mean, it won't help you if you don't understand me. If I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge of prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. And the same is true for you. Since you are so eager to have the special abilities that the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what he has been said. Verse 14, now listen to this closely. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well, then what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit. Okay, I want to highlight that. I will pray in the spirit, but I'll also pray with my understanding. So that phrase, pray in the spirit, means the same thing as praying in tongues. Because... He'll say, I'll pray, I'll pray in the Spirit, but I'll also pray with my understanding. If I'm praying in my understanding, then I'm praying in my own language. If I pray in the Spirit, then I'm praying in an unknown language. I will sing in the Spirit, underline that phrase, sing in the Spirit. Well, if, if, if I sing in the Spirit, now some people are singing in tongues is what that means, because he says, I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. So I can sing, in, if I'm English, which I'm speaking right now, I can sing in English, but I can sing in the Spirit. And if I sing in the Spirit, it means I'm praying in a heavenly language. I'm praying in tongues. Other people are not going to understand me. I'm praying in the Spirit. The Spirit will understand me. I speak in the power of the Holy Spirit, or I sing in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's enabling me to do this, and only God understands me.
So I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. Verse 16, For if you praise God only in the Spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? So he's saying, if you, if you praise God only in the Spirit, so praying in the Spirit, singing in the Spirit, is speaking in tongues, because nobody around you is going to understand. Um, how can they join, join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you're saying? You'll be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. Verse 18, I thank God. Now listen to this here. This is the Apostle Paul saying, verse 18, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. So, he's, understand what he's saying. Put it in context. He's saying prophecy is greater than tongues. He's not putting tongues down. He says, tongues uh, is, is an empowerment of the Spirit. It's a gift of the Spirit. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. But in the church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. So it's just put it in context. Tongues is a good thing. Prophecy is better. So it is written in the scriptures, verse 21, it is written in the scriptures, I will speak to my own people through strange languages and through the lips of foreigners. Uh, so again, I'm going to suggest here, he mentioned two things that are strange languages and through the lips of foreigners. So, uh, when we saw, when the baptism first came in, in Acts uh, chapter 2, there was all these foreigners in Jerusalem, and when the baptism came, uh, the 120 came out of, out of the room prophesying in, in languages, and these people heard them in their own, so they were prophesying, the language is unknown to them, but it was understood by the hearers, the people from other countries. They understood what they were saying. Um, okay, so that, that would be what they said here, through the lips of foreigners. Okay, so it's, it says, I will speak to my own people through strange languages and through the lips of foreigners. So to me, lips of foreigners are legitimate earthly languages. Strange languages, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, well, in the, next, in the next verse, in the next uh, scripture we're going to look at. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Now, this is known as the love chapter, and I'm not going to go into the love chapter, but I'm just going to read the very first verse. It says, If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So, it says, If I could speak in all the languages of the earth. So, in the verse previously, as we talked about the lips of foreigners, all the languages of the earth. And of angels. So of angels. Well, what language does angels speak? Well, a heavenly language. A language that's a, you know, that they use in, in, in heaven that won't be familiar to us. So tongues, there, be, there can be, when we get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we speak in tongues. There's two kinds of tongues that that could be. It could be a heavenly language that nobody on earth is going to understand, and it's just us praying to God. Or it could be a language that is unknown to us, but would be understood by somebody in a foreign country. There's no requirement. If you get the gifts of tongues, there's no requirement for it to be one or the other. It could be either. It could be any. Um, anyway, so, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, so, here's the thing. Well, just what it says there. You need to have love. You know what? There's, when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, that needs to be evident in your life. These things here, these are important. I, I believe that gifts of the Holy Spirit are very important, and they will help you to be witnesses. They will help you in, in encouraging the church and building the church up. They're very important, but uh, without love, if you're prophesying but you don't have love, then you're just a clanging bell, according to the scripture. So we're going to flip over now to uh, further on. I mean, that was 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 14, the very next chapter. Verses 26 to 40. It's entitled, A Call to Orderly Worship. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time, and someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is present who can interpret, 
they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. So when I'm in church, uh, like I, I cannot, and I don't have the gift to interpret tongues, um, <coughs> but I can speak in tongues. So when I'm in church, and if I'm praising God, that I, I, I can pray in tongues quietly, uh, because when, you, when you're going to prophesy, suddenly you speak out at a service. So the whole church then becomes quiet. As you're speaking out, they hear. They hear what's being said, and they'll judge what's being said. Uh, if somebody speaks out loudly in tongues, everything's going to go quiet, but then they're going to wait for an interpretation. <coughs> That's what they're saying. Well, if there's not an interpreter, then don't, don't be speaking out in tongues. Do it privately, quietly. We just read previously that when you pray in tongues, you strengthen yourself. You're speaking privately to God. Uh, sometimes you don't know what to pray, and you're praying in tongues. Sometimes it says, pray, pray in the Spirit, sing in the Spirit. You can praise God quietly in, in, in the Spirit, and, and, and it's just, it's quietly, it's private, it's honoring God. It's not drawing attention to yourself in the church. You're not causing the church to stop and listen to you. So, uh, it talks about speaking in tongues privately. Verse 29. Let two or three people prophesy, and let the others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying, and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak, one after the other, so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy, and don't forbid speaking in tongues. But be sure that everything is done properly and in order. So, I'm going to read that verse 39 again. Be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues. So, when I hear sometimes of, of certain denominations and churches who forbid speaking in tongues, well, that's an absolute contradiction to this scripture. And so, I would, I would just be in great fear and trembling before the Lord <coughs> to take a position that contradicted the Word of God. Um... Churches that encourage prophesying and speaking in tongues are referred to as full gospel or Pentecostal in nature or charismatic. Uh, uh, I know that there are some full gospel Catholic churches. They are referred to as charismatic churches. They have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, uh, expecting miracles and speaking in tongues and prophesying. All of that is happening in a, in a charismatic church. Uh, so whether it be Catholic or any other denomination. There are denominations that forbid speaking in tongues, and they say it is of the devil, or that it died out with the apostles. They are obviously ignoring the scriptures, and therefore are not considered to be full gospel. They are, they are, they are preaching a partial gospel. To me, the Bible is the word of God, and I want to experience all that God has for me. Therefore, I want to keep an open mind. And I, and I suggest you do. Keep an open mind. Use the Word of God as your template and pray to God, uh, and I pray to God, to lead me into all truth, all that He has for me. So I am going to pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as described in the Bible. So listen to the words of my prayer, be in agreement with me, and, and receive from the Lord. Uh, I'm, uh, so when I when I pray, like I, I'm going to ask you, just if you've heard enough scripture, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to pray that first. I'm going to say a prayer of salvation. And if you're if you're not a believer, but you want to be, then repeat these words after me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you a sinner. I confess my sins to you. I ask you to forgive me my sins. I make you Lord of my life and I declare I am saved. I thank you for my salvation. 
And I pray you lead me and guide me from this day forth. You are Lord of my life, and I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you just prayed that prayer with faith in your heart and believing, God is faithful and just. He'll forgive you your sins, and he will, he will be Lord of your life. And as you commit to follow him, he will take you on a journey that is like, unlike any other. You will realize as you go forth that I mean, God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. And uh, now that you're saved, you already have the deposit of the Holy Spirit in you with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But, you know what? Uh, we're now we're about to pray about receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is no prerequisite to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit except salvation. As long as you're saved and in Christ, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now somebody might say, okay, but we read some scriptures there where you need to get baptized. If you've just accepted Jesus Lord and Savior, yes, you need to get baptized. As an example, uh, to be a witness to your friends and family and to the world around you that you now are a follower of Christ. And that's why you would be baptized, uh, following the example of Jesus. But being baptized in water is not one of the prerequisites to getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You could receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit now and get baptized in water next week uh, or subsequently. As long as, you're, as long as you're prepared to follow in the waters of baptism, you can receive the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit now. So I'm about to pray. I want you to Listen to the words of my prayer uh, as a point of contact. I would, I would suggest to just lift your hands to heaven as a gesture of faith to, to, that we are praying to God. And uh, as you lift your hands, you're saying, I'm a Christian and I'm here to receive what you've promised. Listen to the words of my prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone who is listening to this message right now, who have their hands in the air, who want to receive from you. We have read the word, uh, your word, Lord, that declares that uh, there is a, a, a baptism that comes with fire that will clean us, purify us, and just make us pure servants of the Most High God. Uh, as long as we have Jesus in our heart, and we can receive the promise that you gave through Jesus that all who believe in him would receive. Uh, all who uh, hear the message, all those who are far off, uh, the promises for us, our children, and those who are far off. Lord, we thank you for it. And we just lift our hands and we just want to praise you and worship you. And Lord, we give up our, our, our language as we pray in our own language. And we just want to stop praying that we just want to offer praises and thank yous to you in, in the spirit. Hallelujah. We hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. We just honor you and praise you with our lips, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you in Jesus' name that we are receiving the gift that you have promised, Lord. Hallelujah. Folks, I'm going to sign off right now, but I'm going to encourage you to keep on with your hands lifted up and praise and praising God. Uh, if you've not received it yet, just continue to pray, continue to uh, tarry, uh, continue to be in an attitude of prayer, praising, uh, desiring to have all that God has for you because there is more. He will complete this. Uh, you know, and, and, and I'm going to say, if, 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 and, and when you finish this night off, if you haven't received, don't be discouraged. Uh, you can continue to uh, make those prayers, and, and at, at an appropriate time, uh, God is going to gift you, and, and you, it'll just be coming to a place where you can receive it. Hallelujah. Join us next time for the final part uh, called Gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is Bob Manuk from RWM Blue Water Ministry, declaring blessings on you and yours until we meet again. In Jesus' name, keep praying until you receive. Lift your hands and keep praying. In Jesus' name, amen.